November 29, 1992. What happened here that evening was horrible. It's something that you just can't get out of your mind. I have nightmares about it even today. Everybody was in absolute, complete shock. There's blood everywhere. The community was completely rocked. This is Des Moines, Iowa. This doesn't happen here. Is this a dangerous neighborhood? Hey, I'm good. OK, wait a minute. Calm down so I can get the information, OK? And you could hear people just crying. So as soon as I got there, I knew something really, really bad had happened. Des Moines is a very mid-sized community city population about 200,000, metro area 500,000, but it's a white collar community. During the caucuses, it becomes really the center of the media world, at least in the country, if not the entire world. It's just you can hardly drive around downtown without running into a satellite truck or a news crew. And for that reason, I think Des Moines is kind of always punches a little higher than its weight. I think Iowa is fairly white, and that's one of the criticisms of the presidential selection process starting here. But Des Moines is, is more diverse than I think a lot of people realize. It's about 65% white, about 10% black, about 10% Asian, about 7% Hispanic. Drake is located about two miles northwest of Des Moines, so it's, it's close to the inner city. The whole area around Drake is much older homes, just north of Drake University is, is a pretty troubled area. So Drake, because of where their borders are, they have had crime in and around the campus. In the early 90s, I think Drake leadership and also community leaders recognized that something needed to be done to shore up the neighborhood around Drake, or else it was gonna really affect uh, the enrollment numbers, and that was gonna impact Drake negatively, and that would impact Des Moines negatively. There's a local real estate tycoon by the name of Bill Knapp. He put together some investors and he started buying up some of these older big houses. And his vision was let's put up some nice apartment buildings that kind of look like the buildings at Drake with the red brick. And let's also put in a hotel where parents can stay when they come to visit their children or prospective uh, students. The centerpiece of it was a fun diner, a Drake diner. The Drake Diner quickly became popular. It's a big place. It's got a huge covered patio that they can fit a ton of people in. And it just is one of those places where after so long, you know your waitresses, you know the waiters, you know the hosts and hostesses. The food is always awesome. It's just a good gathering place. The restaurant scene was not nearly what it is today. If you wanted to go to a business meal downtown, there were like a couple of supper clubs. There were you know, one or two sort of old family style restaurants. There really wasn't any place kind of fun and hip with a nice vibe. When the Drake Diner first opened back in October of 1987, you could find two young energetic faces there. They belonged to Kara McGrain and Tim Burnett. The diners quickly became a trendy place to eat. McGrain and Burnett just as quickly climbed the ladder of success, rising from waitress and bartender to become key managers in Bill Knapp's small chain of restaurants. From here, Burnett left for a job in Arizona with his twin brother. But time and distance, family and friends soon brought Burnett and his wife back home, back to Des Moines. When they were coming back here to the Drake Diner, it was kind of a mom, uh, monumental occasion to have Tim and Kara working together again. Kara was a local kid. She went to Hoover High School uh, in the city. She was in her early 20s at the time. Kara sat me at my table, waited on me many, many times. Tim was uh, one of the original staff members at the Drake Diner. He was offered the job of general manager. So he had just recently moved back to take that new position with the diner where he had worked when it opened in the late 80s. It was a Sunday night of Thanksgiving weekend. So everybody had had this four-day holiday with family. The restaurant was fairly full, about 40 to 50 customers in it. Around dinner time, around 6.30, 7 o'clock, with people waiting in uh, the lobby area to get a table, this gunman walks in. 
walks behind the front desk where Kara McGrain was standing at the cash register. He says it's a robbery, grabs her. She turns around and says, what do you want? And for no reason whatsoever, shoots her in the head in front of everybody. It was it the shot that we heard first, I guess, and then someone screamed. Oh my God. I turned around, I saw the gentleman with the gun in his hand. The gun was smoking. He was pointing at the register. When that happened, we got down. We, we had two little kids with us, and we pushed them down and got under the booth, and then there was another shot. Tim Burnett had come in on his day off to decorate the restaurant Christmas tree. So he was kind of in the back with his wife, heard the gunshot, comes running out, and the gunman points at him and shoots him at point blank range. And then I just dropped. I dropped behind the bar. I was trying to get underneath the bar, and I heard another shot. A bar went, a light went out behind the bar, and um, I heard somebody yell that he was gone, not but 10 seconds after that. My place. Oh, I need police at the Drake Diner right now. Please, please. What's the problem there? What? What's the problem? Oh, we just got robbed. Our man has been shot. You just got robbed? Yeah. Do you have any information on the person that robbed you? No. Okay. The night of the murders, I was a news photographer here at KCCI. My house wasn't too far away from the diner. My phone rang at home. It was the newsroom saying there'd been a shooting at the Drake Diner. So without hesitation, I grabbed my gear and my car, and I headed that way. Oh, I'm just so sorry. Uh, Did he die? Yeah, oh, God. As soon as I got there, I knew something really, really bad had happened. There were a lot of people, huge crowds outside, with some crime scene tape stretched along the front of the diner, lots of police officers. Everybody was in absolute, complete shock. There's blood everywhere, the smell of uh, gunpowder. One thing I distinctly remember was standing there, and all you could hear was the idling of the police cars, police radios, and you could hear people just crying. It was clear that these murders were not necessary at all. A guy with that gun could have walked in, demanded the money, and she'd have given it to him, and he'd have walked out. There was a real senselessness about it that I think shocked people, and they wanted to get this guy and get him fast. The Smith family was at the Drake Diner when the gunman came in and murdered two employees on Sunday night. They're still coping with the violence they witnessed firsthand. You know, I'll be going along and doing the things I do every day, going to work and, and whatnot. And then, like the wave, just the emotion just overtakes me. It seems like just something I was watching, like on TV. And so it doesn't really scare me that much. You know, it just, it doesn't seem like a big deal. And then other times I like, I think about it and I actually start feeling the way I was feeling. Part of it is, is sadness, incredible sadness, sadness for, for the families who are involved, but certainly sadness for the loss of innocence for my children. The community was completely rocked. Wherever you went, the east side, south side, north side, wherever you were in the city of Des Moines, it was on everybody's minds. You didn't even have to say anything. Everybody was impacted by it. This is Des Moines, Iowa. This doesn't happen here. 90% of us are numb because we just don't want to believe what happened. It just makes you stop back and, and think that, you know, your, your friends, you could be laughing and joking with them one minute, and the next they're gone. They cared about people. They always had a smile on their face. They, they always wanted to know how you were doing that day. And I'll, I'll never forget dancing with Kara at, at Tim Barnett's wedding. The flag in front of Old Main on the Drake University campus flew at half staff today and though classes went on as scheduled, the killings at the Drake Diner were on the minds of many people. It was so tragic that, that people are just shocked. No one really knows you know, what to think about it or if we feel safe walking around here. Now I'm kind of worried about going outside to my car and even going out into the hallway of my apartment building because I'm beginning to wonder whether people can just walk in the door. Or I think a lot of people are scared. The shootings at the Drake Diner have prompted Drake University officials to beef up security here at the campus. Normally we'll have uh, anywhere from four to five uh, officers on an evening shift, and we've uh, expanded that to about 10 officers. 
A few days after the Drake Diner murders, residents and business people in the area took to the streets in support of the diner and the neighborhood. Is this a dangerous neighborhood? No! We were strong and that the people in the neighborhood were there for the neighborhood and were going to stay. It really wasn't until the next day that some of the racial overtones came in and the pressure started coming in from city leaders on the police to solve this thing and solve it quickly. But it happened so fast that they really didn't have a good description. Nobody was able to say, I can pick that guy out of, uh, out of the line. And then he had his head pulled down. And I don't know if I saw a lineup, if I could say it was him or not. Some got a OK look at the guy. He was described only as a young black man. He had a, a long coat on with a hood up. And then there were varying descriptions of whether he had a face mask on or not. But a lot of people got sort of a glancing look at him and they hit the deck. Police want to distribute a composite sketch of the suspect, but they're having trouble with 40 witnesses describing 40 different gunmen. So you can't make a composite from 35 or 40 different descriptions. Because the description that police gave out was very generic, because that's all they had, it was basically a young black man. You know, and that could describe hundreds, if not thousands, of people in the, in the community. So I think that there was a fear among black leaders that everybody was being targeted because of this uh, broad description of, of the gunman. These 50 young African Americans converged upon the steps of the police department to express their concern over possible generalizations born out of the vague description of the diner homicide suspect. Anyone remotely fitting the description may feel personally threatened and may automatically be considered a suspect. We are concerned that without a clear and precise description of a suspect, that unnecessary and unfounded harassment, detainment, and arrest could occur. The white community, I think, understood those concerns, but they just wanted to get this thing solved. Akeo Abdul Samad says there's no way to keep race out of it. You have basically a double standard within the community itself. We look at, what, a couple years ago when two young black males in the Drake area were found murdered, you know, execution stop. We're not looking at the same type of publicity. We're not looking at the same type of concern. That accusation has always been absurd. The uh, police department gets no credit for not solving crimes. We get credit for solving crimes. Police are banking that the gun he used will be the key to solving the crime. This is a 44 Magnum, brand name Desert Eagle. It's an eight-shot semi-automatic pistol, one of the most powerful handguns in the world. They believe a pistol like this was used because of cartridge cases found at the scene. Somebody else said uh, they thought it was a different weapon that they had seen, called an LAR Grizzly. Whoever had that gun shows that gun off. He showed that to friends, he showed that to girlfriends, whatever. And somebody's going to call us and tell us that I've seen such and such a gun with somebody. And if they do, there's $20,000 possible to enrich them a little bit. When they figured out that it was one of these LAR Grizzlies, it's, a, it's an unusually large weapon, and there weren't a lot of them. It's made by a company in Utah. They called that company. They had only made 450 of them, and police said, can you send us the names of the gun shops where you sold this weapon? And they said, sure, they did. And so police suddenly had 450 guns to track down, which is a relatively small number, but still a lot of work in the United States and Canada. So they started assigning police officers two or three states. One of the Des Moines police officers was assigned to the state of Washington. And when he called police in Seattle, or Kings County, they checked through the gun shop. They found that a local gun enthusiast there had bought one of these Grizzlies and that it had been stolen about a month or two before the Drake Diner murder. So he called Des Moines police and said, we've got one that was stolen. The confidential informant, police call CX, told police 17-year-old Joseph White Jr. was at a party later that night at 1517 Washington and fired a shot from a big handgun. Police say a slug pulled from that house matches those found at the Drake Diner. The gun is believed to be a rare Grizzly 44 Magnum handgun, 
It's never been found, but police believe it's still in Des Moines. This petition charges White with murder and robbery in connection with the diner shootings of Kara McGrain and Tim Burnett. We have filed charges on Mr. White. If you note, I have not said anything that we have filed charges on, on Mr. Clark. Alf Freddie Clark, the other suspect named by police, has not been charged. Well, it turns out that Joseph White went to school with this gun enthusiast's daughter. And while the parents were out of town at their hunting cabin out in the woods, she had a party. And Joseph White comes on out and spends the night with some other people. And that's how they drew the connection that uh, he had to have stolen that gun while he was at this party. These two individuals are innocent. They're innocent individuals who have been one who has been charged with the crime. They're not, they haven't been proven guilty by no one. Family members of the two teenage suspects say they can't believe police have taken the boys into custody for the Drake Diner shootings. They say Joseph White Jr. and Alfred Freddie Clark are not guilty of the murder and believe authorities have arrested the wrong men. The white community, I think, felt very relieved. There was a lot of reward money had been offered for information, and I think leaders of the black community felt, well, that's going to bring out people who are going to say anything about anybody, and this kid is being railroaded. They were very upset and felt strongly that Joseph White was not the gunman. Well, it was after the arrest, after, after they had arrested Joseph White and charged him, but they didn't have the weapon. And I think they were afraid, if this guy gets acquitted, all hell's going to break loose in this community. Well, the trial took place relatively quickly in May of uh, the next year. And interestingly, the defense attorney asked for a change of venue because there'd been so much publicity here about this case. And the judge denied it. So the trial was held right here in Polk County. And it was a high profile case. For the first time, deputies presented Joseph White Jr. to a Polk County judge as an adult. The 17-year-old appeared for his arraignment. His family and supporters watched from the hallway behind a plate glass window. Public defender John Wellman formally pleads to the charges. We in our plea of not guilty, Your Honor. We... Police have said little about why they charged White. We should know more next week when some key court documents are made public. We do know that police never found the murder weapon, a rare 44 Magnum handgun. As sources said, police matched bullets they found at the diner to a bullet they found in this Des Moines home where White reportedly was here at a party. White's defense was primarily that the prosecution called it the Sodi defense. Some other dude did it. It was basically that there was uh, somebody else had uh, fired the weapon into the floor at the house near the Drake Diner. Somebody else had fired the weapon on the, in the housing project in Seattle. And uh, he did admit that he had brought the gun to Des Moines when his mom drove him to Des Moines. Well, how did you get that gun? He said, well, it was a going away present from the, the bad guy who owned the gun and fired the gun. He denied being at the party. Basically, his defense was you had a very generic description. There were a lot of witnesses at the diner who gave different descriptions of the gunman. So the defense put all of these people on the witness stand trying to cast doubt on those who had given a positive identification of the gunman. You know, these people that talked about the mask, all those people got to be mistaken. The case went to the jury after about a week. Everybody thought this is going to be a pretty quick verdict. Monday went by, Tuesday went by, Wednesday went by, Thursday went by with no verdict. And the normal wisdom is the longer a jury is out, the more that's going to help uh, the defendant. Drake Diner employees and customers were riveted in front of the television as the verdict was read. Did the jury find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree, signed by the poor person. When Joseph White was pronounced guilty, there were hugs, tears, and relief. I think justice has been done. Uh, I felt all along that he was guilty. But on Friday, the jury came back and uh, convicted him of two counts of first degree murder and one count of first degree robbery. Joseph White Jr. showed no emotion as Judge Ray Fenton read the jury's verdict. The jury now says they believe it was Joseph White who walked into the crowded diner on November 29th, shot McGrain and Burnett, and walked away with several hundred dollars in cash. Minutes after the verdict, two demonstrators arrived at the Drake Diner parking lot with signs claiming Joseph White Jr. had been railroaded and justice had not been done. It was so hyped up, there's no way he could have got a fair trial here in Polk County. Emotions are high. And right now, it's a lot of shock. I'm shocked. 
my friends are shot, and we're out here trying to say that we don't think that was a fair verdict. So White was initially sentenced to the state penitentiary at Fort Madison, the most secure facility, but he was just a problem from the beginning, always getting in fights, having all kinds of difficulties with the guards. So there was a program a few years after he was sentenced to trade prisoners with Texas. They'd send us some of their most dangerous, we would send them some of our most dangerous. On the van trip down to Texas that Joseph White is in, somewhere in the middle of Kansas, they overpower the guard that's driving the van and they escape. Well, it turns out there was like a Kansas State Trooper Convention a couple of uh, miles away. They all came pouring out of the hotel, rounded up all, all six of them. But because he had escaped, he then became subject to the federal court system in some way. So they ended up putting him in the Supermax uh, facility in Colorado with no chance of escape. Today, White learned he'll be resentenced at the Polk County Courthouse. This comes after a 2012 U.S. Supreme Court ruling banned mandatory life prison terms for offenders under the age of 18. So they had brought him back to Polk County for his sentencing, and by this time in 2016, he was 40 years old. A Polk County judge resentencing White to life in prison with the possibility of parole for each murder charge, plus 25 years for the robbery charge. Those will be served consecutively. 30 years have gone by. I think people feel um, that as awful as it was, it was solved. It was solved relatively quickly and with what I believe most of the community feel is a great deal of certainty that they got the right guy. TV 8's Martin Augustine is live from the Drake Diner. The owner, Bill Knapp, who had built it, wanted to get it reopened as soon as possible. Are they gonna show up in droves and say, this is our community and we're not gonna stand for it? It's very, very busy this morning. In fact, about 35 to 40 people lined up in front of the doors before it opened, and that has not slowed down here at all. The best thing for the community, maybe to help it start healing, was to get the diner back open and get the people back inside. Good morning. From the moment the doors opened this morning, it became clear the Drake Diner would survive its haunted past. Oh, I, I think it's going to be fine. I think it's got a lot of support and that'll continue. Um, you know, I think it's just a very difficult time for a lot of people to get through. It's still great. It looks just the same as it did that night. Today, the diner is stronger than ever. I think the community has moved on. My guess is that Certainly many of the students who go in there, even their parents uh, who are visiting go in there, have no idea of the awful thing that happened there on November 29th of 1992. The only vestiges of this crime at the diner are once a year when the Christmas tree goes up and they put the ornaments on. There's an ornament with a picture of Tim and an ornament with a picture of Kara front and center on that Christmas tree every year. Those of us who've been around for a while, pause, say a little prayer, it's emotional every year when I see them, see the ornaments on that tree. And I'm sure the vast majority of people go in there and either don't even notice it or wonder who are these two people and what happened here.